Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Vishal Sarikonda. I am joined here today by my colleague Abriel Madisek. We will be presenting on a recently completed study uh, evaluating the impact of CAV market penetration rates along the US 33. Great presentation, by the way. We will be touching on similar topics, I guess. So, yeah. OK, uh, going to presentation overview. Uh, I'll be going over briefly what the study objectives were and describe what the study area is, where it is and all. And then we'll be going back and forth describing all the scenarios that we planned for. We conducted uh, simulation runs. We kind of divided this into two phases, phase one and phase two approaches. Uh, and then we will summarize the key findings and end it with some kind of lessons learned thing at the end. Uh, I'll skip this slide. Study objectives. So the client for this study is Ohio Department of Transportation, ODOT. So ODOT is very interested to evaluate the operational impacts of uh, connected automated vehicle CAVs on their newly built US 33 Smart Mobility Corridor. Uh, it's rightfully named. I'm going to touch on it in the next slide. Uh, so they they wanted to see how CAVs will impact, whether it's going to be like a disruptive or in a good way, like if it benefits them in any other way up as far as operations are concerned. That's their idea to like start off with this project. Uh, so we use travel demand modeling tools, TDM and micro simulation tools, PDV groups, VSIM, uh, to see how the CAV penetration rates would impact uh, changes in trip patterns and like the operations on the corridors that we are trying to evaluate. Okay. So the study corridor, uh, it's a pretty long corridor comparatively. Typically we would start off with like a smaller corridors, focus on certain areas, but uh, this is kind of uh, non-traditional. Uh, 34 miles long. It has 18 intersections and interchanges. Most of them are interchanges. Just the east end is a signalized corridor. Uh, we have like three to four intersections over there. So the west uh, end limits are at the city of Marysville where we have the Honda manufacturing plant. And they are one of the interested parties in this uh, study as well. They wanted to test their upcoming CAV featured vehicles along this corridor. So that's why ODOT is interested too. And the east end is at the city of Dublin. City of Dublin itself is like part of uh, greater Columbus metro area and like northwest region. So as of 2021, I mean, right when we are conducting this study, uh, around September 2021, the road 40 mile stretch of US 33 is completely uh, built out underground with uh, high, high capacity fiber optic cables and hundreds of roadside units. So the purpose is to like link these and provide these features to researchers or in a sense to autom uh, automotive manufacturers like Honda or anybody, mostly Honda. So they can test it out their vehicles and use these features along. So the implementation of CAVC in Ohio will be much quicker, and that's the idea, than yeah, if we didn't have these features. So this is just a map of our study corridor, uh, US 33. Uh, the west end limits on the northwest side is where the Honda manufacturing plant is. It starts exactly there. And the yellow part is the city of Marysville, and just a uh, Side note, city of Marysville is the world's first connected city. I don't know the definition of what they def what they mean by connected, but their entire city's 30 intersections are connected uh, with some kind of infrastructure to facilitate the CAV uh, movements in the future. So yeah, they are actively in coordination with the manufacturers over there. Um, and this whole stretch is now linked through fiber optics and hundreds of roadside units along. And the green part is our bottleneck location or the critical area, which has the highest amount of volume flowing through in our study corridor because you got this. Uh, can I point it? Yeah, we have I-270. Uh, that's a loop road around, around Columbus City 
interacts with US 33 and you have this huge weaving area over there. Uh, so it just messes up our traffic patterns all the time. So that that we will come out uh, with some uh, results how our bottlenecks are uh, performing as far as CAVs are concerned later on. And so this whole stretch from northwest until we reach that green part end of the green portion is a limited access highway or freeway facility and then it kind of transitions back to like the local arterial for the city of dublin uh, so the red portion is where we have like three or four intersections so that's the challenge as well for us while we are trying to like uh, code this whole thing into one coherent uh, model so we used uh Wisim 2021 version for this uh, analysis um so we didn't write any scripts at the uh, for this study at this point, but we used the in included logic internal logic for uh, CAVs. I think they have like three different ones, like cautious, normal, and aggressive uh, kind of behaviors. Uh, depending on the situation, we kind of tweak those and uh, use the UDAs uh, for our advantage uh, to post process the results, or also to sometimes assign a new, new unique uh, IDs to get what we want along the process. So with this, this is the study area. Uh, we will be jumping like 40 years ahead, uh, 30 years ahead, 2050. Yeah, and we'll be discussing the future scenarios, how this uh, corridor performs with various penetration rates at the time, starting with a Nobel situation. If you have 0% volume, or 0% CAV volume, and all the way if you bump it up to 100% CAV, uh, what kind of changes are you seeing capacity wise operations wise uh, what are the disruptions or the impacts benefits and all those things so uh, my colleague gabriel will start uh, describing the scenarios and the various phases and i'll jump in for phase two uh, descriptions thank you uh, so as vishal described we had um, various um, scenarios with different uh, cav penetration rates um, and again, we modeled these all under the feature year 2050, and we focused on the PM peak period. Um, and again, this was kind of done in two phases. Um, phase one was done back in 2020, and it was kind of like this preliminary phase. Um, and we were asked to test out um, kind of a no build condition with 0% CVs, um, a 30% CV uh, penetration rate, and a 60%. Um, and also we're asked to start off using the normal AV behavior in VISM, um, but we did do some testing of the aggressive or all knowing behavior. Um, so just kind of the difference between those two, um, the normal AV behavior kind of performs similar to that of not uh, non autonomous vehicles. And then the aggressive behavior um, kind of allows uh, autonomous vehicles to be aware of the entire simulation and leaving minimum gap between vehicles, which leads to cooperative driving. Uh, so we did do some. Sorry, so we did do some testing um, with the behaviors and then as Vishal explained, um, we did do some testing of using 100 uh, percent CV penetration as part of the second phase of the study. Um, with varying demand, and for that, we only stuck to using the all-knowing behavior. Um, and all of these scenario inputs and routings came uh, from travel demand model runs. Uh, so this table just kind of summarizes all the different scenarios. Again, scenario one is kind of like that no build with 0% CVs. Uh, scenario two, it has 30% uh, CVs. Um, normal behavior and also includes any induced demand from that. Uh, scenario three, Similarly, um, has the induced demand, uh, but 60% CAVs. And then the last two, um, we kind of wanted to just directly compare to the no build. So we use the same demand, um, a 60% CAV penetration rate, and then just switching it between that um, normal and all knowing behavior. And then for phase two, scenarios A through B, kind of similar. Um, scenario A has that no build demand um, from phase one. Uh, and then scenario B includes uh, induced demand and scenario C includes um, induced demand. Plus, uh, they wanted to test out having an additional lane along the corridor. Uh, so this slide just kind of shows the post processing steps, um, how we went from the TDM to um, some inputs and routings. 
Um, so basically, we a TDM was ran for every scenario, and a select link analysis was done at each input location, um, and then that was kind of translated into each system scenario, uh, depending on whatever growth or changes in the travel pattern that we saw. Uh, so for the phase one results, uh, so this shows a system-wide demand. Um, so again, scenario one is that no build. Scenario two and three have, again, a 30% and a 60% rate, CV rate, um, but they do include that induced demand. Um, and these also use that normal behavior, so we're not quite seeing the benefits um, that induced demand kind of offset the benefit of including CVs with that normal behavior. Um, and then scenario four shows, um, again, it's the same demand in scenario one. It shows that with the inclusion of CAVs, you do see some reduction um, in unserved demand. And then in scenario five, with that all-knowing behavior, you see an even greater reduction in unserved demand. Um, and then similarly, and a lot of these are going to be kind of repetitive with uh, how the results look. Um, delay, again, in scenario two and three, you kind of see an increase in delay compared to no build. Um, you do see a reduction in scenario four um, and an even greater reduction, about 17% um, under scenario five, again, with that all-knowing behavior. Uh, we also wanted to look at not only the peak hour, but kind of observe what happened in the post-peak hours. Um, so we added on four hours uh, to our model. And so this just shows latent demand for those uh, total of five hours for the different scenarios. Um, again, scenario four, um, we do see a reduction in latent demand and scenario five, especially at the end of the fifth peak hour, or the fifth hour, you do see a latent demand getting close to almost zero um, with a 90% reduction compared to no build. Uh, and then we also looked at travel time along the corridor. Um, and this one just has the three scenarios that have the same demand. Um, so in the eastbound direction, you see that scenario five kind of sticks close to uh, free flow travel time, which is around 35 minutes or so. Um, and uh, in the westbound direction, you kind of see similar results. Scenario five is a lot better. You do kind of see it getting um, a little higher compared to eastbound because westbound was the peak direction for the study um, uh, during the PM hours. Uh, and the thing we mostly got out of this is that CVs, um, although maybe they don't fully uh, help in the, P in the peak hour, you can definitely see its benefits um, in the post-peak hours. Um, and this slide just kind of reiterates everything I just said. Um, Overall, from the TDM results, we did see that about a 1% increase in CAV penetration rates, increased total trips by about 0.1%. Um, and again, that all-knowing behavior um, was kind of pushed a little bit more, especially for this corridor. Um, so moving forward, we kind of suggested that only the all-knowing behavior be used. Um, so that's what was used uh, for the phase two 100% CAV rate scenarios, which we shall will be talking about further. Yeah, so for phase two, it's all 100% uh, CAV scenarios. Uh, we have three scenarios we tested. One is just using no build demand from if you, if you replace the existing regular traffic with 100% CAVs, just to see for the same amount of volume how CAVs would behave on the same corridor. And the next two scenarios are basically the same. They have this induced demand, which we got from uh, TDM, uh, where they are like significantly higher, about roughly around 10% or so, uh, but at select locations as well. It's not like everywhere it's increasing. For that, we added an additional lane for scenario C because if you just test it out for no build with regular traffic, we know this system is failing. So they wanted to add a lane anyway in the future for some kind of capacity improvements along this corridor. So what if the capacity improvements are still in place? And if you have CAVs uh, on the roads by 2050, what would be the scenarios? That's why we are testing uh, scenario C. Uh, we had to do some modifications along this process because uh, the inbuilt VSIM logic is pretty good, but it doesn't answer or like uh, uh, provide solutions for all the scenarios that we are trying to test. 
and the individual circumstances that I'm going to explain in the next slide. Some of the issues we saw in scenario A is uh, at bottleneck locations or any other locations, whenever a platoon forms, uh, like on the outer lanes of a weaving area or an, um, on a merging section. So what happens is that platoon right now, the internal logic doesn't have any way to disperse them off unless the platoon vehicles have a nearby exit point. So what happens is they are basically forming a wall for the merging traffic. So the merging traffic can't get in unless they are like at the back of the platoon or in front of the platoon, but the pr platoon itself doesn't disperse because there's a vehicle beside them. So that's like uh, something we I think PTV will address. Uh, we were definitely in touch with them when we had this issue. So the only way we could think of is we have to have some kind of lane by lane assi assignment. And in those lane by lane assignments, we just uh, remove this platooning behavior for that particular lanes where they have this most amount of interaction with this merging or weaving traffic because you have uh, no, no benefits with that. So, and we would not. From this, we found out larger platoons are only useful if you have a basic freeway segment. If you have like merging, weaving segments, you want to have smaller platoons or no platoons at all because you you will have impacts because of the platoons itself. That's what we came to know from this study. So that's what we did, and this is a prime example. Uh, of the CAV induced congestion. The other graph that you're seeing, the latent demand is scenario one or scenario A where it has 100% CAVs. Because of this inbuilt model induced demand uh, uh, where you should see like a curve after post picor it kind of dips down. Uh, it's just going up. So we need, we had to tweak these things uh, in the model after seeing these issues uh, where we assigned, as I said, lane by lane adjustments, driver behavior adjustments increased caps for leading vehicles and also when a platoon can form like you have these features in Visim where you can say if your vehicle is following a leading vehicle within 800 feet okay I'll go join that vehicle at the back and form like the back vehicle of the platoon so we kind of played with those distances and removed platoons for some areas reduce the platoon sizes and all those things and then uh, this is how the results look like uh, the first one is just 0% CAV noble uh, scenario and the other three are scenario A, B and C replacing the volumes and induced demands and the overall demand goes up with the induced demand of course but the nine percent latent demand in the zero percent uh, CAV is reduced down to like two percent or three percent which is significant now that CAVs are there that's a good thing and the same way with delays delays go down um, uh, in the interest of time I'm just skipping over some of the slides but this is a good slide basically showing a bottleneck just if, if you're traveling westbound, that's like east of bottleneck and this column is showing west of bottleneck. So whatever vehicles are trying to enter and go through is that difference you're seeing 6500 entering 4700 exiting out. Rest is kind of stuck in between if you're trying to gauge it and the percentage increases if you try to uh, pump in more CAVs into the system. And by the time you reach 100%, uh, we are seeing roughly around 25 to 30 percent increase in capacity uh, with them, even with induced demand. Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, the last one we can take it uh, with a pinch of salt because it's an uh, added lane. Uh, the research kind of supports it. Uh, we saw the research says around 30 percent capacity improvements is something you would observe uh, if you replace the existing traffic with CAVs. It ranges between 25 and 40. We are definitely not aiming to hit that number, but somehow our numbers also correlate with those. But we need to keep in mind there is a lot of model induced congestion still lingering, and that will be our next steps going forward to like even eliminate those things because at this point we don't know exactly how CAVs behave. The most we can make use of is like uh, tweaking these uh, individual parameters. Uh, these are some of the travel time results as well for those scenarios. Uh, no, no build 0% through those three. The the top curves are the no build curves where the peak hour travel time spikes up and stays throughout post peak and goes down only after like four hours into the study period. Uh, whereas eastbound, it's not that uh, peak direction. So you see CAVs are handling pretty good. In the westbound, the scenario B induced demand kind of fails. Uh, it still has like 40. Uh, minute travel times post peak, but once you add an additional lane, it kind of goes back to like the typical 35 ish range uh, typical travel time. So pretty good benefits overall. Uh, we have observed there is distinct operational significant operational and capacity improvements with CAVs. Uh, all the scenarios were performing 
uh, as uh, expected with some tweaks and all, uh, but there's definitely work need to be done uh, that we understood whether uh, we can perform this in a better way or remove the, any model induced congestion still in the network. And along this process, some of the lessons learned are. Uh, I think I just mentioned we, we, we need to just tweak uh, some of these parameters in a better way and of course uh, reduce the model induced congestion. So yeah, some great presentations overall during this meeting where we learned about the EOC controller from uh, Mike's presentation and the first day bye bye scripting by Levi, where they mentioned there is some kind of formula editor going on in the new versions, which we are interested to check as well, where we can use EDAs and inbuilt ones. So because for such large models, right, it's not just having a com script that helps it, but sometimes time is money. So these models take super long to run. I think we just set it out for two days, even with like best available computers. There's only so many courses that can help us with uh, simulation of this model. So inbuilt support system like how PTV is mentioning will definitely help with those times. So looking forward to that. Thank you to PTV, ODOT and Honda for mentioning the name. Thank you.